has many particular areas of research strength, including being an experimental physicist, and she works at the intersection of complex materials, superconductivity, and nanotechnology. And so I think that's a great example of different disciplines that come together uh, to be able to make advances in research and science. She's been recognized with many honors, including being a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a founding director of the NSF-funded Illinois Material Research Science and Engineering Center. She was elected to the Faculty Center, Senate representing the Granger College of Engineering. She has mentored, for all of you who are grad students, 32 different grad students and postdocs, and she has authored 60 peer-reviewed publications. She earned her PhD from Stanford University, and we're so happy to have her as one of our leaders here at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Thanks so much for joining us. So much. This is such a pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to see so many women's, women, women in tech. Um, you know, it, it's hard enough enough finding enough women in academia up on the other side of campus, and seeing all of you here is really fantastic. So I'm happy to hear a little bit about all of you. Um, let's see. My favorite things to do. You will you will find me very often at the farmers market, running in at you know 11:55, and <laughs> trying to meet get all the stalls and just hanging out talking to friends. Um, you will also find me at Friday Night Live in Champagne, which is Fantastic, highly recommended. And my new favorite thing is to go paddle boarding at Homer Lake. So uh, they, uh, if you can find, get your hands on a paddleboard at Costco, it is a really, really fun thing to do and very relaxing. Um, so uh, let's see. This was a this was an open-ended talk where they said, just talk about your life and lessons learned. And so I put lessons learned in my title, um, and hopefully that's kind of good enough. Uh, but also, I just want this to be more of a conversation, so there will be plenty of time for questions along the way or afterwards, or if you want to hear more about any particular topic, just raise your hand and say, tell me more, and I will just go on and on about it. It's everything here I could talk about for probably an hour or more. Um, so, uh, so I've titled this Lessons Learned, Trying to Make a Difference While Balancing Research, Teaching, and what else? Outreach and Family. And I know this is something, all my perspective is academia. I've been at Illinois for 18 years, as Laura mentioned. Um, I've raised two kids here in town. It's been fantastic. Uh, but it is, it is a lot, and I suspect that many of the challenges that I've faced are, are similar to what you all are facing in whatever fields that you're in. Um, I'm a condensed matter experimentalist, which means I have a lab, I have right now six graduate students, I've mentored many, many graduate students and postdocs, undergraduates, even high school students over the years. Um, my research is studying nanoscale materials, so looking at what happens when you make things at 10 to the minus 9 meters. Everything changes at that length scale. Um, examples are nanotubes, nanowires, anything with nano, nano superconductors, you get the trend here, anything with nano in the title, we study. The, the physics question that's interesting to me is what happens when you make things very small? And the reason that's interesting, if you think about it, you can take a piece of metal, like, okay, these are plastic spoons, but if you had a metal spoon that's just a piece of aluminum or something, and you kind of know how that's supposed to respond, and if you think of the electronics of it, which is what I'm interested in, you can put just a simple ohmmeter on it, and it obeys Ohm's law, V equals IR. So, you know, metals, you've learned this in you know, second year a &M, they kind of do standard things. On the other hand, we have atoms, which the metals are composed of, and those do totally different things. Right? Atoms have shell fillings and quantized energy states and um, wave properties, and they do all these crazy quantum mechanical things. So the question is, how do you go from single atoms up to materials? How do the properties change? Right? How do you go from these wave functions to having a spoon that you bend? And so that's actually a really interesting research question, and you can start approaching it by looking at nanoscale things. So if you take a nanowire that's 10 atoms across, you can see how you're at the scale where it still has wave properties and quantum properties, but you can also just measure the electronics across it by putting on a voltage and seeing the current. And when you do that, you get really interesting physics that emerges, as well as you know, relevant to different technologies, like how do you scale down computers these days? You know, what do the next generation transistors look like? There are systems that will have to you know, have that, they're already susceptible to quantum properties. Um, and also, if you're going to build up the next generation computer, which is maybe a quantum computer, you also have to understand the integration of quantum and classical properties, which is so the fundamental studies we do are relevant to these really advanced computing studies. Um, I'll just give one example. Has anyone here heard of graphene? Good, great. So that, that's one of the nanomaterials that we study. This is 
just one of the more incredible materials that was discovered in the past 15 years. It was discovered, and it's probably the easiest route to a Nobel Prize ever, um, at least technologically. <laughs> the people literally just took graphite, which you can find in a pencil. I don't think they used a pencil, but they could have. And the reason, reason graphite um, writes so easily is that it's made of uh, sheets, and the sheets just slide when you write, and that's what it looks like on a really small scale under the pencil there. And then if you take that graphite and just take scotch tape and just keep peeling it, like peel some and then peel tape, like put tape on the tape and just keep peeling, you just keep separating out the layers until you can get to single layers of graphite, which are called graphene. Um, and then that graphene is, is it's kind of crazy. It's, if you think of a single layer of graphene, it's just a single atom thick, right? So it's like having single atoms just open in the air on a table where you can practically see it. It's actually, you'd think it would just evaporate or it'd be unstable or you couldn't study it. It turns out it's totally air stable and you can put it under a, a, a strong microscope and see it and put electrodes on it and measure it. And then you're really, really at the nano limit where you can see what happens to the single atom absolute thinnest material limit and what new properties emerges and what new devices you can make. And so that's, that's, a, that's an example of the sort of material that we, that we specifically study in a lab and think about its properties. Um, and I think about electronic properties, again, I, make, I think about really, really simple circuits where you have effectively a battery, the material is my resistor, we measure the current through it. Um, but because it's a nanoscale material, that current is not just linear V equals IR, but does sometimes crazy things based on the specific electronics and the quantum properties of it. The pictures you see here are just, uh, sorry, the, the pointer doesn't work on screens, but it's a uh, simple circuit schematic, and then there's another schematic that just shows sometimes you can pass a couple of gate, and that's me with an apparatus that goes to ultra low temperatures, that was me. Um, 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Looking very young. But we measure these things at low temperatures because thermal effects are not so interesting to us. They're really interesting for other reasons, but we want to get to the mode where things aren't excited by temperature, but rather the quantum mechanics comes into play. So we put things in this apparatus with liquefied helium, helium 3. It cools it down to near absolute zero, about 10 millikelvin, which is 10 milli, like 10 thousandths of degree above absolute zero. So very, very, very cold. <laughs> um, and then all these quantum properties are apparent, and um, this is an actual image of what graphene looks like under a very strong microscope. You can see that that shadow there is the graphene, and that is just a one atom thick sheet, which is still impressive whenever I see it. We put electrodes on it. And you can just measure things like this. Conductance is a function of the, the voltage you put across it. has this really interesting V shape, which shows that it's a, a gate-tunable ultra-thin device which means that you can use that then in transparent electrodes because things that are very thin are transparent. It's very flexible because, again, things that are very thin are very flexible. And yet it has, and it's, and it's also tunable with just a voltage. And so you can start making all sorts of novel electronic devices just with these very simple nanoscale materials. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about research. We do a lot of fun physics, a lot of fun material studies. Uh, you know, some of it is more relevant applications, some of it's just really cool. I'd be happy to answer any questions about any of this afterwards, but, um, or, or now, if you want, there's no afterwards, whenever <laughs> they can tell me when to stop, I don't have a clock here, I'll keep track of time. Um, but, uh, if there are any research questions now, and I will um, move on. You can look at the website, which is probably not updated, but it has some stuff on it. So, you know, that's how it goes. Um, okay, so how did I get here? Um, I, uh, I, I didn't. I mean, I, everyone always asks me whether I loved physics since I was a kid, and this is I just always knew I wanted to do it. Um, and that's just not what, that wasn't true in my case. I had a really weak physics background in high school. Um, I barely remember taking a physics class. I think it was probably terrible. I took one. I took one chemistry class. I was advanced in math, but then I only took AB calculus and not BC, which meant by the time I got to college, I was behind, at least for a physics major. And so I had a, just a relatively weak background. I spent most of high school doing sports. Um, I was an elite gymnast for many years. I stopped after my sophomore year and then I ran track. I liked math. Um, I did have one internship in biochemistry, which was great because it was the first time I'd been in a lab. This is after my junior year of high school. Uh, I mean, you guys are all <laughs> working here, so I don't know what you're... So for me, I just didn't know that you could do lab work for life. It was like playing around all day, which was fantastic. Um, I realized biochemistry was not for me because it was very squishy and you're not supposed to put your hands in liquids. Anyway, um, it was fine at the end of the day, but you know, 
I was much better off with the harder material stuff, but I did want to realize I wanted to do research at that point, and so that's what got me interested in, in, in doing science as a career. Um, I was at Harvard as a physics major. Um, I got there and took a bunch of science classes and um, realized that, uh, that physics was the way that I liked understanding the world, basically. And so, um, you know, I remember chemistry, and I'm sorry about all you chemists out there, but chemistry was difficult for me. Um, and none of it, it was just, it was kind of terrible, actually. And then one day we got to the part of the periodic table where it turns out it's atomic shell filling and everything makes sense and you can build up all the fundamentals from there. And I thought, wow, chemistry could be amazing. But then I realized that that was actually physics. And so <laughs> it turned out that physics was amazing for me. Um, and I was a physics major. Uh, in high school, in, in high school, in college, I also had summer internships. A lot of these were internships were special for um, people underrepresented women or underrepresented minorities in, in sciences, uh, which was great because it helped me find cohorts of people. Um, you know, like we like many of you, I was the only one in many of my college classes. Uh, you know, there was a couple of us, but there certainly wasn't a cohort of women or people of color or anything like that. So going to these programs and finding just people who were super supportive. I mean, it wasn't even like, you know, they had any special attributes besides, besides just you know, being nice to each other a lot and being supportive of each other. And it turned out that was amazing. I didn't know that was missing until I actually found it from some of these programs. So, you know, meet everyone here if you can. You know, pay attention to your cohorts. That's what supports you through, um, through careers, at least for me it has. Um, Went to Stanford, did a PhD on two-dimensional superconductors, uh, went back to Harvard for a postdoc and fellowship, had my first daughter as a postdoc, um, and then started at Illinois in 2005, um, combining topics that I worked on as a, as a, a in my PhD work and in my postdoc work and kind of forging a new area in nanoscale superconductors. Um, had my second daughter in my third year there, and so I, so I wrote in my tenure papers, I finished my six year tenure clock with a three year old and a six year old. So you can imagine that it was um, busy. <laughs> I barely remember it actually, I think that's part of a, I, I think it's either it was so busy that I just have a hard, like there's so much happening, or I think it's just selective memory. That like, I just blocked out whatever happened during those years and it's fine now. Um, and I became a full professor in 2016 and you know, I have other activities that I'll talk about since then and both of my kids are grown and actually if I started, I came when my daughter was five months old, my oldest one, and she's going off to college next year. So it feels like a full cycle that I've gone through and it's been, uh, it's actually been really great all the way through. Uh, okay, so just, I just want to share a little bit about what I do. I put work in, in quotes here because it's, you know, it, it's not that, it's not that work is my life, but it is that I feel like I've been lucky to have the opportunity to have a job that allows me to do many different things that I care deeply about. Um, and so I just want to share some of that because, and one of the benefits of having jobs in research, having jobs in technology, is that there's lots of different aspects. It can be research, it can be outreach, it can be mentoring. And all of those things are important and um, you, can get, you get to decide how much of each you want to do while fulfilling your own goals. Um, so, um, as, as was mentioned, I, I have a lot of students. Um, I've mentored, uh, you know, over 25 graduate students, lots of undergraduates, high school students, high school teachers. To me, having students go through the lab, working with them, is one of the joys of, of the job that I get to do. Um, and uh, and seeing them go out in the world and, and do so, do things is really satisfying. Um, I've taught lots of different classes, write papers, give talks, write grants. Right? All of these things are extremely time consuming, and that's sort of the faculty part of the job. I also do a lot of service, service to, um, to science, to, to physics specifically, um, you know, examples are on, on, on the National Quantum Advisory Board, there's this big National Quantum Initiative and our job, which we spent a lot of time over this, over this past semester, was to write a report about um, rec recommendations for what the next generation of National Quantum Initiative should look like. Um, I was on the General Council of the American Physical Society, I spent six weeks studying all the defense needs of the U.S. military, which was extremely interesting. Um, so it's, you know, it, it was cool. <laughs> a lot of different things that service. I also do a lot of service to the community. So, you know, there's things within the field that I do. I also think about giving back. To me, this is personally important, and I think um, one of the ways that I want to be able to make a difference, especially since I feel like I've benefited a lot from programs over the years that were encouraging people like me to, to achieve my goals, so I want to make sure that others have those same opportunities. 
Um, so I was chair of the American Physical Society Committee of Minorities, for example, where we started a mentoring program. Um, I give a lot of talks, <laughs> a lot of, go on a lot of panels, just like kind of like this, sharing experiences. I also really have a passion for communicating science. Um, you know, just being able to share some of the exciting things that we do. Again, making sure that people, I think it's important for everyone to know more about science and technology, just to make educated choices whether or not they want to go into science. It's not just kids, but everyone, I feel like, benefit, especially in this day and age of, of AI and phones, and it's so integrated that I, it's hard to imagine, um, like I said, making, making educated choices about our lives without understanding some of the basis for it. Um, and so I had, you know, for example, a, a Wednesday segment on WCIA where I did live physics experiments for 10 minutes every week. Right? Um, and it was, it, was, it was actually fantastic. It was, probably my, it was my, you know, probably the thing that trained me the most in public speaking and feeling comfortable because doing experiments live, um, you know, experiments don't always work. So you know, no matter how much you practice, I remember there was one time it was Halloween and I was trying to make a soap bubble that was like that big with dry with liquid nitrogen under it or dry ice or I don't know what it was, but it didn't work for a long time. And on TV going, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. You know, news anchors are cutting me off and stuff. And, and finally it comes and it works and it's this big glowing orb that comes out and everyone goes, ooh. <laughs> anyway, it, it was fun, it was interesting. Um, so, you know, so things like that are, are important to me and also um, they keep things fun. And more recently, as mentioned, um, I, uh, I've, since, since 2017, I've been director of the Illinois Material Research <coughs> Science and Engineering Center. Um, this is a grant that I led. Um, it, uh, there's now about 20-something faculty involved. It, it integrates education, research, outreach, facilities development. I love running grants like this because they allow me to create a research ecosystem, meaning that I do think of research, of even science and technology, not as just being in the lab, but as integrating education, as integrating outreach and communication, as integrating um, just having a collegial environment where people can thrive. All of these things to me are important, and selfishly I kind of like creating environments where I want to work. And so I feel like if I create an environment where I'm excited to come in every day, where people come to me and say like, how can I be part of this, then, then that's a success. Um, and so I feel like we were able to do that with, with the Merced. Um, I also just led it through its uh, recompetition phase and it just got renewed for another six years. So, which is great, so I'm handing it off to someone else and uh, going to do my other job, which is being director of the Illinois Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology. And the Beckman Institute is a little bit like what I just described as the Merced. Um, it's, it's another research ecosystem. It was the first interdisciplinary scientific institute on campus. Um, it has themes that relate to human intelligence, um, data information, and also um, molecules, basically building up knowledge from the, from the ground up in different areas. And, and, and we also, we, so you know, since starting at Beckman, I've been able to, you know, there's, been, there's many, many great things. People already love being at Beckman, so it's great having a great base, but we didn't, for example, have a DI committee, and so I was able to institute that, and they've already done really great things like, you know, opening up the gates, or, you know, they put, um, menstrual products in the men's room, for example, so you know we can be open to everyone. So there are things like that that, that we've been able to do even since starting. That's been great, as well as just kind of boost research in all directions. Um, so that's just been a really great experience, and I'm happy to talk more about that. And again, that's a, another full hour <laughs> talk, saying more about that. Okay, so uh, so you might know, I mean, my point here. My point here is that it, there's, there's a lot. I do, I mean, all of the things you see here, I do probably two or three things in each category all at the same time, and so it's pretty busy because I also have two teenagers at home. Um, but it's, it's also really exciting, and it's really engaging, and it's really fun, and it's what drives me every day because I do also get to choose to do these things. I mean, half of the things here, I could just, I'm a tenured professor, so I could just sit home and like, you know, eat bonbons and teach a class, and you know, it's fine, I keep my job, it'd be fine. Uh, but that's not really fun, and that's not why I'm here. I'm here because I like making a difference, and I like learning, and I like engaging. And um, it's busy, but it's also really and, and I think that, for me, things like outreach and service are not extras, as I mentioned. They're not things that I just do when, you know, because I have to or because I'm expected to do it. To me, they are a major part of my mission and my job, and it's important for me to, out, to, to integrate that as well as I can, while also doing a really good job at work, and that's a challenge, and we can talk more about that. 
but you know, be a good scientist, a good researcher first, and then integrate things as much as I can. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a couple lessons that I've learned. Um, these are actually totally random, they're not the only lessons. There's many, many more lessons, but these are just a few things that I thought I wanted to share today. Um, one of the things I mentioned is that outreach and service are integral to my work. Um, you, one reason for this is I do really feel like one person can, can make a difference sometimes, especially when you're underrepresented. And you can think of how it feels when you're in a room and it's all men, for example, and then one other woman walks in. And you're like, ah. you know, at least I am. You know, and, and, or, or you know, if, if one person, if something happens and one person speaks up for you. You know, we know that feeling of, of one person making a difference, and I think that, that's really true. Um, when I first made this slide, I was like, oh, the power of one, and then I realized, I wasn't alone, there's a whole bunch of pictures on the power of one, but okay, because there's something to it, right? Um, and, you know, but the, but the thing is that we want to, I think it's important when we think of making a difference to think about how we can be most effective, right? Because how do we know that as we do our jobs, as we do everything else in our lives, that we are using our time wisely, even as one person in, in choosing what we do. And so when I think of things that have had to be most effective in what I do, um, I think about, for example, how do I get a big effect from a small effort? You know, not that you always make a small effort, but if you can get an outside effect from doing something small, then that's worth your time. And one example for me is that I organized these um, quarterly women in physics lunches for my department for many years. And actually, I didn't even organize them. All I did is send an email to the staff secretary and say, will you please invite everyone to this luncheon and order food for it on this date? Like, that's literally all I did. <laughs> and then, okay, then I showed up and I like, had people introduce themselves. But no one had done that before. And honestly, since I stopped doing it and I got these other jobs, no one's done it since then. Um, we started, okay, someone else, my friend started this year. But there was years when nobody, when nobody did it. It was a really easy thing to do. And when I talked, we invited undergraduates, graduates, and faculty and staff. And when I talked to graduate students about it, they said that this was one of the most impactful things for them. Just having this cohort, we got together regularly, and we all talked, and we were all together, had a huge outsized impact. And all I had to do is write an email and just do it on a schedule. So things like that are always, always valuable. Um, it's also worth thinking about sometimes what it takes to make something better. You know, if, we, if you're in a group or joining an organization, I, you know, there, there are good committees and there are, are better committees, let's say. You know, and I've been on committees where we kind of chat and maybe not a lot happens. I, I don't like being on committees where we're not trying, where we're not thinking of, where we're not strategizing, right? But it's really good to apply strategic thinking to your outreach as well, right? So apply strategic thinking to all aspects of your life, and I think this will be a theme that you'll hear from me. Um, think strategically about, about why you're on this committee, why you're in this group, what you want to do, and what it'll take to make something better, and then whether it's worth your while and whether you have the time to do that. Um, an example for me is I, when I was um, chair of the American Physical Society's Committee of Minorities, they had this fellowship program that they've just been doing for years and years, and they just gave scholarships to something like 20 students a year, and it was really nice for the kids who got scholarships, but it had a very limited impact. And so when I joined, I just asked the question, is this the best we can do? Is this the most impact that we can have? And we ended up sending out a survey to our whole community asking them, you know, what are the barriers that prevent underrepresented people from succeeding in physics? And then we got that back, and number one was high school math, and we couldn't do much about that. But number two was mentoring. And so we just started a mentoring program with the goal of assigning a local mentor to every single underrepresented physics student in the country. And that's kind of sad because it means the numbers were really small. There was like 600 people. On the other hand, it was a goal that we could achieve with the same resources we used to just give fellowships to 30 people previously. And so then we did that. That's when we started this program called the National Mentoring Community because we thought about what would it really take to make this better in a very strategic way. And that program is continuing today, which is great. Um, and then the last thing is that, you know, sometimes with small numbers, I think a lot of people feel like they have to be doing something. I know my daughters always come to me and say, like, oh, I should be doing this, and I should be doing that. And I assure them that, you know, they're really busy. They have to be successful. They have to do well in their schoolwork. You guys have projects this summer. You have things you have to do. Sometimes just being there and succeeding and just being engaged and sometimes even struggling, you know, just being present means something. Right? So don't undervalue you know, the, the importance of just being where you are, of just engaging with people around you, right? Of just speaking up when necessary or staying quiet when necessary, just improving the climate in small ways, 
All of these small things, including just showing up, um, does make a difference. And you know, as I said before, it's important to make time to do outreach. It's also crucial to do well at your work okay, overall. Um, one of the ways I try to think about this is, um, is you know, I try to think about, I try to like, I strategize about what's most important, and then I also just figure out when my schedule is full. I know that you know, I, what I consider a full schedule, and when it's full, I just don't take anything else on. And so it is important to be realistic about how much you can do while also keeping time for yourself. Okay, other lesson. Um, so I think this is probably true for everyone in technology and in science in all fields, is that we have to learn to continuously cope with, with to cope with continuous opportunities and challenges. And so I, what I mean by this is, for example, in academia, there's a cycle. So grants usually last about three years, and then you have to write a new grant on a new topic. Students usually graduate after five or six years. And so when I got tenure, this you know, five or six year cycle, I was really happy because I thought, this is great. I've, I've, you know, I got students, I trained them, I wrote some grants, everything's going well, I'm just gonna continue as it is. And then one year later, all of my students graduated, all of my grants ran out, and it was like I had to start over again. And it was really psychologically difficult just to think about doing that process over again because technology doesn't stand still. Science doesn't stand still. And so this is great for, for, for renewal. Right? If you want to think about keeping things fresh and exciting. To me, it's really bad for stress. So it's very stressful to have to keep pushing forward all the time. Um, and you know, for me, I, I've learned to cope with this by really focusing on opportunities, having plans for myself of what I want to do in one year, what I want to do in five years. You know, sometimes they're very local plans, like write a grant, right? <laughs> Make sure the kids are healthy. And sometimes they're big plans, like you know, run a, you know, write a big center grant, try to get teams together, try to do these things. Um, it's important to take the time to be proactive, not just responsive. You know, sometimes there are so many opportunities and so many changes that we tend to just try to respond to everything happening all at once, and then we never have a plan for what we want to do. And so it's good to think consciously about proactively planning what you want and the choices you make, and not just responding to everything as they come. Even if you don't get to respond to everything because you're taking the time to think, that's still better to let them, a few things drop than it is to just let things happen to you all the time. Um, and then also failure is not the worst thing. I put failure in quotes because I don't even know what that means. There's things that work and things that don't work, and you know, there's there's opportunities we get. And you know, I remember when I when I was going up for tenure and I just wasn't sure it was gonna work, at least a couple years before that. And you know, I knew that I wanted to have kids before tenure, and I knew that that was a risk for getting tenure because it's just Hard, but I, it was more important to me to have kids, and I knew that that meant that I might have to get a different job. And you know, when you put it that way, it's like, okay, then I would get a different job. Right? It's not that bad. You can think of it as like, oh, I failed at this thing, but it's not. You just make a change, and if you know what your priorities are, making changes isn't that bad. And so that's why failures in quotes, because it really changes, and you should be conscious of when you make changes. Okay, and the third thing is maybe related to all this is keeping track of priorities on, on a regular basis. As you juggle lots of things, which I'm sure everyone does already, we'll do more and more of in life, um, keeping track of priorities every day. You know, what are, what are you doing during the day? Why are you doing it? What is it worth spending your time on? Keeping track of it weekly, keeping track of it yearly. Again, this is just part of being a little bit proactive about what we want and what we choose to do and what's important to us. And even if we say, you know, family and friends are most important, which they really are for me, it doesn't mean that I'm not working at my job as hard as I can and that I work long hours. It's that when choices come up, that's what I think about, and it's okay to think about that. So, you know, these are just things we reevaluate. Re and, you know, you can course correct, you know, have, has something changed? You know, I've, I've had family members who've gotten cancer and gotten ill. I re and you reshuffle, you reevaluate. It's okay to do that, right? Your career is long, your life is long. Not, not one month off, six months off, these things aren't going to long-term affect your career, but it is important to be there for the things that are most important to you when they happen. Um, being underrepresented, I feel like there's more than three. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's two threes. So interesting. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to be really quick three, um, and then I'll, I'll just end. Um, being underrepresented at work is still, is still difficult. Um, I, I took these pictures here, one is from a conference that was some years ago, and the other is like the president's cabinet a few years ago, and you know, they look very similar, not a lot of representation there. 
Um, so numbers change very, very slowly. I hate to say that. I mean, they're sometimes a little bit better. I know in our department, the number of, of women graduate students has gone from something like 13% to 30%. And so that's a huge, huge difference. And so numbers do change. But they can seem slow and slower than we want. And you know, the landscape also shifts. So I have a unicorn here, because I remember when I was in graduate school, and even when I was when I was younger, when I was you know, starting as a professor, and you know, I, I you know, I get the sense sometimes that people are treating me like a unicorn. You know, you're the only one there, and you're special, and you're succeeding because you're just different in some way. And people were pretty supportive of that, but it still wasn't really treating my authentic self. It was really treating me as representing something. But then you sometimes find that as you start competing with people at a different level and they feel threatened in terms of, you know, you could have a better job than them or you could be doing better. You're no longer a unicorn and then other sorts of troops come in. Like, you know, if you if you stand up for yourself, you're you know, you're you're out to get people, or you know, if you're if you if you're if you you know, express any level of sensitivity, you're just emotional or hysterical or something like that. Or, you know, my favorite, like, you know, the angry black woman. You know, if, if, you, know, if you speak up for yourself or, you know, the angry woman in general. So all of these things come into play, um, you know, and you can't help it. This is, this is not on us. This is on other people. That's their problem. You know, I'm not, I'm not any of those things, but if people think that that's their problem, but it is good to understand that. It is... It is still a struggle, but just in different ways. And sometimes it's just helpful to know what directions that those, those points are. Um, not that you can affect how people think about you, but you know, we just do our work and you know, they can do their thing. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna say much about any of this, so I'm gonna stop now, but um, just, you know, there's lots of challenges being under, underrepresented in academia and technology in general, um, you know, things like imposter syndrome, bias, isolation, I have a whole bunch of things I say about doing on this, but most of them have to do with just focusing on priorities, finding support, finding cohorts, um, doing our own work, because again, it's hard, it's really hard to change other people's minds. It really is, I hate to say that, but it's really hard. And so the best thing we can do is try to create environments where we're treated professionally, and we have support from each other, um, and inside and outside. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to end with this. These are some, some some bits of advice I've always tried to follow. Being healthy. Healthy is really important. You can't do anything if you're not healthy. Um, working hard. Doing what interests us. Prioritizing. Really big. So I went through an exercise once, which was really fun. I mean, it, which I loved. It just had us write down what our priorities were in, in all aspects. And it had things like you know family and friends and exercise and work and just you know or other aspects of work. And for me, just writing writing those down. And I, I didn't. I think I even listed them in some order. It gave me a little bit of a framework to think about when I made choices, how those choices lined up. If that makes sense. And it's not that I will always I'll leave work to go be with family, but I realized that that's an important thing to fit in. Right? And that friends are an important thing to fit in. And if I'm not fitting friends, if I'm at a point where I haven't seen friends who are important to me in a week or so, then I'm not prioritizing my life right. Does that make sense? But maybe you mean more specifically. Do you mean like lots of different tasks or something like this? Or? Um, I guess like, in terms of like women in career, like um, obviously both like career and family. Yeah. And I guess in different times, in different life, it like is different. So um, I guess it's a, yeah, I'm trying to ask question. I guess how do you know when to Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm a big scheduler, so you have to schedule. I mean, I, I, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you want to have to, me, if I want a family and career, then I have to be really scheduled. Because I can't just come home at five and be like, okay, now, you know, who's going to make dinner? You know, it, it just, or, you know, who's going to take the kids to the playground or something, or who's going to finish that report? Because if you do it that way, then you don't, there's not actually enough time in the day to just spend hours and hours doing one thing and then hope the other thing happens. And so I was a big planner in the sense that like, you know, with the kids, five to eight thirty was secret time with them, like nothing came into that. And then I'd go to the gym and then I'd be like, and then actually I didn't much to the gym because it would wake me up and then I could work for a couple more hours. And so like, you know, and then I'd do a report or do something there. And that was kind of like that was my schedule for like ten years basically. But I also, you know, I I live by little sticky notes of what I'm gonna do every day. And I actually write out like how many hours, like what is the time I have free, and what I'm going to do in that time. Because if you just have a mess of things that you want to do, and you just say I'm going to do them all, that's not realistic. And so sometimes you have to figure out what is the time you actually have, what's the most important thing for you. And again, not being reactive, not what's due, but what's the most important thing you want to do, 
when are the other things going to happen looking at your schedule going some time out? And if some things don't fit in, then they don't fit in and you have to drop them. Right? You just have to make those choices sometimes. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Along the line of the notes question, um, I know you said you have to like schedule time to do things that you prioritize. So how do you I mean not like how do you prioritize yourself, but when do you make time for yourself and what do you do as like your downtime for yourself? Yeah. Um, I go, so one of the things I do, I go for walks all, every day. I have a, a friend here, and we, she, she texts me first thing in the morning often, and it's like, when are we going for a walk? And then if I have a hole in my schedule or anything like that, we will find time to walk for usually between 20 minutes and an hour every day. Um, with her or with another friend, so I, I walk with my friends almost every day. Um, and that's for me, both kind of therapy plus walking exercise sort of thing. Um, uh, so your question is, what do I do, or how do I find time for it? <laughs> I, I make it so, so I make the time for that, right? If there's holes, I do that. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I'm not right. I'm not a workaholic. I know my work. I mean, I work, and I like to work. My work, I do it. But I, I just, uh, you know, I exercise pretty regularly. I walk with my friends. You know, we go paddle boarding, like I said, and then do other things like that. I try to cook. I, I, I try to cook as many five star New York Times recipes as I can, um, because you know they're not. Okay, they don't all work out well, but um, so like I said, I have time at home that's still pretty sacred, right? After work, I will I always set aside time to make those recipes. I do all of my shopping one day a week because I can't afford to go to the store every day, otherwise I don't have time to cook. So I know what that schedule is like, um, and I um, and then I schedule around it. You know, I do have the time that is for me or for my family or for things I want to do. And the other thing is, even you know, even if I want to take time off, I, at some point I realized that I would take time off for going to work conferences. Like I would just schedule in a four-day work conference or like, traveling to give a talk pretty regularly. But I'd never schedule in a fun trip regularly because somehow it didn't seem valuable to me to have fun for myself. But I could go on ten work trips and I never thought twice about it. And so now I schedule time for me in advance in the same way that I schedule work trips. And I just tell people around it, like I'm gone, I'm doing these things. And if it's on my schedule, then that's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> There's no backing out of it. And so that's another way that I just make sure that I have that time as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, either one. Um, in brief, what the recommendations are from your perspective, if you could just tell us. For, for the, rec the quantum recommendations? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay, the report, the report just came out, so I can't talk about it. But yes, I mean, this is, this is a very specific thing about the National Quantum Initiative, and it had to do with the fact that um, most of it, most of it is congressional reports. It's mostly about just more funding for quantum and for facilities and for fundamental engineering type studies and um, and, uh, and for more quantum centers. So, uh, but if you're asking, you know, the, the, the key thing is that quantum technology is still primed to have a huge impact in the future, but there are fundamental issues that need to be solved before that can happen. So we're not quite ready to scale up. I don't think we're ready for the next quantum computer in five years or even 10 years that's commercial, but it could happen after that if we get the engineering right. And it's interesting to see that translation from it's, it's fundamental science problems to actual fundamental engineering problems. So it's like the difference between creating the transistor and creating the integrated circuit. You know, these both were Nobel Prizes in physics, so they're both huge advances, but one of them was a real, you know, small, you know, small element, one device thing, and the other is a multi-device thing, but they're both fundamental advances. So what we need now is the, is the IC board invented for quantum. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. My kids want to follow my footsteps. Yeah. So my, I, I hate to say it, but you know, I'm, I'm a fundamental physicist. But I wish that I, I always wish I was more of an engineer because I like, I really like the idea of making things that are, that have impact and have an effect. So I encourage them in that direction. Uh, so my older daughter um, is, she loves robotics. She's wanted to do robotics since she was two years old. And she was actually here at the last fire thing. I don't know if anyone was here and saw the control Z. So she was the tech, the tech captain for a control Z for the thing that the one big one world this year. And then my younger daughter was the operator of the robot arm mm -hmm. at the thing. So they're both involved in that. And she's, uh, my older one is going to MIT to study robotics next year. So kind of in my footsteps, you know, <laughs> but kind of not. So more tech. The younger one, as long as I don't say that I'm happy,
ask about anything she does, then she'll continue to be interested in science and technology. So I just pretend I don't care. Don't tell her she's not here. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, you told us that like you were you were writing some really really bulky papers at the same time that you were having with your kids, and a lot of like career changes, while lifestyle changes are going on, like both really really big things that clearly have a lot of impact on you. Like, how did you prepare yourself for knowing that? all of this was going to be happening at one time where like, you were taking such big steps in both directions. Like, how did you just kind of like mentally prepare yourself for like, I don't know, how, how yeah. it really was all of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Have I actually gotten some benefits and to get in here? So I will say that it was hard. Um, you know, I, I, you know, a lot of, it was hard. There were two things. One was that I knew that, I knew that it would be hard and I knew that I definitely wanted kids beforehand. And I also knew that I was willing to not get tenure. And having that in my mind, it wasn't that I wasn't going to work like crazy to get it, but knowing that if it didn't work, I had a, there was other jobs I could do, it was worth it to me, took the stress out of it. Because I think a lot of the time, when we have a lot of things going on, it's the stress that kills us as much as the actual activities. So not having, you know, because I had no stress, but not feeling like it's going to be a full disaster if it doesn't work out, understanding that if it doesn't work, there's other things I can do, made it much easier for me to handle psychologically. Like it wasn't the end all be all. It's not the end all be all. I mean, it, this is this is what I want. But if it doesn't work, you know, I'm, I'm happy with these choices. Um, the other thing is that it, it, I knew that you know, especially for acting movies, this was a time scale of a couple of years, maybe a year and a half, where I just worked like crazy. Like I did nothing else. That was when I, you know, I would just, you know, I'd do work and I'd be with the kids, and that's all I did all the time, every day. But I knew that it was a limited time scale. So in my mind, I was like, okay, I can do this like this for six to nine months. And then after that, I'm not going to live like this. But for the short time scale, for getting tenure, if there's every minute, you know, it's not like it happens every year, but every five years, there's something like that. And I'm willing to do it for some amount of time, but not forever. And then that's also psychologically easier, because if you're working all the time, you know, you know that there's some short-term goal, but then long-term, you're going to have your normal life again. So there's help in those situations, because it's not always like that. You know, now my, like I said, I'm going off to college, and I'm incredibly sad, and I'm like, it's just hard to believe that I'm like, just not gonna, you know, I don't, yeah. <laughs> I can do more work. You can, you, know, you can do, and you do progressively more work, but that doesn't make up for not having kids around. Um, yes, we're, is it think time? We're at <laughs> our time. Yeah, right. I gotta say, thank you so much, Professor yes. Mason. I think Thanks you're the most impressive person I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that with everything you said, I kept thinking, and, and, and. <laughs> It's time for this, so I don't know how you get all of that done, but thanks so much for squeezing us in I and sharing you. some of your lessons with us and inspiring us to, to do more and to be more inclusive as well. So thank, thank you. My pleasure. pleasure.